Hi everyone and welcome to my online lecture. Uh, today I will be talking to you about a project which combines two great passions of mine, which are um, conserving urban biodiversity and promoting human health. I will be sharing with you some research and projects that Dr. Zoe and I have undertaken as part of the um, Terrestrial Ecology Lab of Monash University Malaysia over the past two years and in the process hope that you will be able to take away a more holistic um, understanding and appreciation of ecological applications in everyday life. But before I get too far ahead, uh, please let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Siren of Monash University, Malaysia, and I'm an ecological anthropologist and ethnozoologist, which are basically fancy words for describing someone who studies the intricate relationships between human communities and the natural environment. I'm also something of a lepidopterist, which is yet another fancy word to describe someone who studies butterflies and moths. While the subject of this talk may cover a range of themes that you are already familiar with, we will be really focusing on two basic concepts which are urban ecology and urban biodiversity. So while urban ecology is the study of how different organisms interact with one another in an urban environment, uh, urban biodiversity, on the other hand, describes the number of different organisms that can be found in that environment itself. And so some of the topics that we will be exploring further today will include understanding some basic ecological interactions that happen in urban spaces and of course um, the human impact in all of this as well. The urban environment represents perhaps what is one of the most dynamic and impactful environments in the world today. We are living in the era of the Anthropocene where the scale and extent of our actions on nature can no longer be denied. In fact, we are single-handedly responsible for more ecological and geological changes on the planet than all natural phenomenon put together. And just as our population has grown, so too have we modified more and more of the planet's surface to suit our ever-increasing needs. But while urban environments were built primarily for human habitation, they have also created opportunities for some species of plants and animals as well. New niches, unlike any other found in the natural world, were created, and various creatures capable of adapting have colonized these niches and created entirely new communities with various implications. But while some species have managed to thrive in the urban environment, a majority have not been so lucky. Millions of years of adaptations to various environments in nature have suddenly become a liability in the man-made world. In fact, one of the primary features of the Anthropocene is that it also coincides with the sixth mass extinction event. The collapse of ecosystems through habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, and the degradation of the environment are just some of the many ways in which human activity has threatened the natural world. And while various efforts are being undertaken to protect some of the more charismatic species of animals, the extinction of others, such as insects, has largely gone unnoticed. In what was quick to be labeled as the Great Insect Apocalypse, media outlets began reporting that scientists were noticing a significant loss of insect populations. Among those reports included estimates of global populations decreasing by 2.5% a year, to projections that all insect pollinators may be classified as endangered over the next decade. But the reality, while sobering, is a lot less straightforward than that. For starters, a lot of what we do know is based mainly on studies conducted in North America, so it is still uncertain how these trends are reflected worldwide. But while the exact figures remain unclear, what is clear for most entomologists is that the threat is undeniable and that something needs to be done. But just like other animals, some insects have thrived in the urban environment where others have failed. Over the past couple of years, the Terrestrial Ecology Lab at Monash University, Malaysia has conducted several studies on urban biodiversity. One of these included surveys on the diversity of mosquito species in urban and forested areas. Over 26 species of mosquitoes were recorded in one of our forested sites. In contrast to that, only two were recorded in urban areas, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, which are known vectors of the dreaded dengue fever. Dengue fever is a severe and infectious mosquito-borne disease that affects many individuals from tropical regions worldwide. 
and the numbers are rising every year. In Malaysia alone, over 130,000 individuals were infected last year, which is a 61% increase of infections from the year before. Because of this, many are understandably advocates for the extermination of all mosquitoes. But the simple fact of the matter is, while some mosquitoes such as Aedes do transmit diseases to humans, many others do not. And aside from providing these harmful mosquitoes with competition in their very crucial life stages, some like the elephant mosquito of the genus Toxorhynchitis may be even downright beneficial. You see, the brightly colored adults of Toxorhynchites feed exclusively on nectar and may even perform a limited role in the pollination of certain plants. But more importantly, the larvae of Toxorhynchites are voracious predators who feed almost exclusively on the larvae of other mosquitoes. Here you can see a Toxorhynchites larva feeding on the larva of an Aedes mosquito. Attempts to introduce Toxorhynchitis as a biological control of Aedes in cities has been performed in the past, yet these beautiful giants have often failed to thrive due to the lack of clean water bodies and the general inhospitability of the urban environment. And so here lies the crux of our problem. We have engineered our urban environments in such a way that it has become conducive for problematic species and harmful to beneficial ones. With fewer competitors and natural predators, warmer ambient temperature, and no shortage of breeding grounds, the population of Aedes and Culex mosquitoes are able to thrive with a much shorter life cycle than they would normally have to undergo in the forest. Unchecked, these harmful mosquito species are able to undergo several generations of population explosions in the urban community. These population events often correspond to the spikes and increases in cases of disease like dengue or malaria. So while it may sound a little counterintuitive, if you think about it, having a higher diversity of mosquitoes may actually reduce the incidences of mosquito-borne diseases. And because diseases like dengue and malaria are capable of becoming epidemics, governments in affected countries have employed a wide range of methods in an attempt to combat and control the spread of mosquito-borne diseases. One of the most common methods that is deployed in Malaysia is the practice of insecticidal fogging. Insecticide fogging is the release of toxins in the form of aerosols or hot vapor into the environment to kill mosquitoes. But because these toxins are indiscriminate, we suspected that such practices were detrimental to biodiversity and may even exacerbate the problem. In 2019, the Terrestrial Ecology Lab of Monash University, Malaysia embarked on a year-long study to investigate the indirect effects of insecticidal fogging on non-target invertebrates. We performed a series of fogging sessions across 10 different sites in the state of Selangor and ended up collecting 1,874 different invertebrates across 19 different orders. Of these, we noted that beneficial insects such as mosquito predators and pollinators suffered up to a 72.7% mortality rate, and more shockingly, that none of the affected insects were Aedes mosquitoes. While we are currently in the process of writing up this data for publication, the implications of the study are clear. Such practices are harmful to the biodiversity of urban communities and may even have undesirable effects in the longer term. And so one of the methods that we have explored was to adopt a more comprehensive and holistic approach by constructing sustainable environments that are conducive to a supporting a biodiversity of life. Insects in general make up some of the essential building blocks of our ecosystem. By restoring the biodiversity of urban communities with a focus on beneficial species such as pollinators, we believe that we can alleviate the problem by reintroducing some of the natural checks and balances that keep the population of problematic species and disease vectors in check. In early 2018, our team ran a short pilot study investigating the impact of butterfly gardening on improving the biodiversity of an urban plot. We adopted a community assembly approach by first repopulating with a range of plants selected by native butterflies as hosts. In time, the diversity of plants in the plot increased due to the natural colonizing of other species. As the compiled table here indicates, we were able to witness some truly amazing results of this project in just under a year. 
we record an increase in the diversity of butterflies and other pollinators on site. We were also able to record increases in the local vertebrate communities as well, including several species of amphibians, reptiles and small birds. Due to the uptake of natural predators, we hypothesized that this would have an impact on local mosquito populations, though further studies to conclude this are still needed. Butterflies were ultimately chosen as our flagship species for the project because, as adults, they share many resources with a wide range of other beneficial insects. As generalist feeders, many of the food sources for adult butterflies are suitable to sustain the populations of other pollinators. Additionally, butterflies in both their adult and larval stages are attractive food sources for a wide variety of other animals. And finally, as many urban butterflies are large and easy easily recognizable, they were also prime candidates for simple observational studies. From an educational perspective, we also found butterflies to possess the strongest cross-cultural appeal across broad demographics. Their visibility and inability to inflict physical harm also make them good candidates for community science projects and amateur study. In fact, the pilot butterfly garden project was set up with the help of students, and a portion of the population monitoring was even incorporated as part of last year's Introduction to Ecological Applications class. Fortunately, if you have even a bit of land at your disposal, setting up your own butterfly garden is not hard to do. All you really need to start is begin by observing and identifying the butterflies that are native to your area. Once you've done that, you may begin by planting a selection of host and food plants that are appropriate for your local butterflies. Even if you don't have land to work on, you can still contribute by urging your respective representatives or institutions to set one up for your community. And to help you on your way, we are even willing to share a range of our resources to help you get started. Here you will find a Malaysian butterfly ID guide, a list of butterflies and their host plants, and templates for setting up your own community science projects. And this concludes my talk on urban biodiversity and human health today. To summarize, I first began by looking at the impact of human population growth and the scale and scope of the Anthropocene. Then, I discussed its relations to biodiversity loss and the effects of this on human health. Finally, I highlighted the importance of maintaining biodiversity in urban environments and provided you with some suggestions on what you can do to make a difference. Once again, thank you so much for tuning in. Stay safe and stay healthy.